What's up everyone? In today's video, I'm going to dive into the match between Mohamed El Sharbagi and Joel Macon from round three in the World Championships. Now this is a match that I was really, really excited for because the last few times these guys have met, it's gone to five and they've split the last couple of matches. So I was, I was thinking that for round three early on in such a big event to have this kind of a matchup is truthfully amazing for the spectators, but pretty tough for the players themselves. So I was really amped up for this match. And for those of you who, who have watched it, you'll know that Mohamed Sharbagi won three love. And when I watched the match, see, before I watched the match, I saw the score line and I was like, oh man, like what, what the heck happened? Because I was expecting a 90 minute five setter. And then I watched the match and I decided to analyze it for you guys so that we can see what makes Mohamed Sharbagi so good. So this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to show you guys a few rallies from each game, and I'm going to highlight some of the things that he did really, really well. And truthfully, if he continues with this form, I don't think there's anyone else that's going to be able to stop him in this event. So in a minute, I'm going to play the final rally. This is game point from game one. And this, this rally really summarizes the way the entire game was played. And essentially, Shrabagi was hitting his targets extremely well, both on the length the width in the back court to force the loose ball, at which point he was then attacking the front court quite well. Macon, on the other hand, was not hitting his targets in the back, and then he was also not being severe enough with his attacks in the front. What I also noticed was that Shrabagi was mixing up the pace extremely well, and he was being very patient. Anytime he was under a little bit of pressure, he would just pop up a higher ball on the front wall, give himself time to recover, and those balls were glued. One, one sign of being really accurate is that on most of his lengths that Shrabagi would hit, whenever Macon would go and try to hit the ball, you could hear his racket clanking on that side wall on the glass. And that's a good sign that, you know, Shrabagi is finding the perfect length so that the ball is getting stuck to that side wall right when Macon is about to hit it. And this is something I'd like to clarify for you guys is that a great length, a tight length, isn't necessarily one that's just glued to the sidewall. It could be off the sidewall early on, but if it gets closer and closer to the sidewall and catches the sidewall right when your opponent is about to hit it, that's actually an extremely effective length. So kind of with those points in mind, let's take a look at this first rally, uh, or the, the last rally of the first game. It's nice height by both players over here. Shrabagi changes up the angles and pace again. Another change of angle by Shrabagi. Nice hold by Macon. And good defense by Shrabagi. And they're back into the rallying position. Nice attack by Shrabagi and reset by Macon. That's a great counter by Macon and a good get. Shrabagi's under pressure. Macon has him under pressure, and Shrabagi just rips a winner. So that right there shows you that the rallies were hard, the rallies were long, there's good change of pace. In that rally, actually, Macon was more accurate than he had been kind of throughout the previous game. But just the way Shrabagi finished it, which shows that he's unstoppable. He's under pressure in the back right corner, hitting a three-wall boast into the nick. Like, there's nothing you can really do against a player when they're playing like that. Now, game two, this is game point again from game two that I'm going to show you in one second. And Shrabagi continued to be super duper accurate throughout this game. I noticed that he was actually playing Joel Macon largely on the backhand side of the court. And let's check out how this pans out. So again, change of height, change of pace by Shrabagi. Putting in the attack when he gets it. Has Macon under pressure. And there, so, and I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes, but you see this here. When Shrabagi forced his boast, he had so many options over here because he's hit so many shots, so many variety, like such a large variety of shots from the backhand side that Macon had no clue what ball was coming. And that's why Macon kind of moves to the left and the ball's going to the right. So now over here, we're going to jump into game three, but I'm going to show you guys a few rallies from game three to highlight different elements of Shrabagi's game that he really, really just exemplified in this game. So number one, Shrabagi 
his accuracy never waned at all in this entire match. And what ended up happening is by game three, Joel Macon was obviously feeling the pressure. He's down two love and the other games weren't necessarily that close either. And because of that, you will notice Joel Macon actually started to hit a few more tins that he normally does because he he needed in his own mind to try to find a way to end the rally because nothing else was working. So let's check out a few of these rallies here. So there's some good height by Shorbagi to push Macon into the back and same by Macon. It's tight by Macon and Shorbagi and Macon hits the tin. That's him trying to be too fine, trying to win the point outright. Now, if we continue, you'll notice in this rally that that's good pressure by Macon, actually. And another good shot by Macon to apply pressure, but Shrabagi's defense is just so strong. See Shrabagi, anytime he's in a bit of pressure, and that was a good little camera glitch by the, by the Squash TV folks. Anytime Shorbagi's under pressure, he just very calmly resets the ball just like that. He gets a loose one, pressure applies. And right there, and I'm going to dig into this in detail, but you see how Macon's having a stutter and start and stop every single time when Shorbagi's hitting a ball? That's because Shorbagi is using natural deception, which I talked about once with Cameron Pilly, and I'll link to that video. And then Shorbagi's also putting in a hold, and he's hit so many shots from the same position. So see Macon over there, I'm going to rewind that for a second because I was talking. But look at Macon's lack of accuracy. He forces a loose ball in the back, but then his cross-court nick is just way too loose. So he just wasn't severe enough going into the front. His accuracy did get better into the back over time, but not good enough. And then let's check out game point between Shorbagi and Macon. So it's good pressure by Macon, and truthfully, it was only right at the end that Macon started playing harder and faster and putting Shorbagi under a lot of pressure. See, Shorbagi's having to do a lot of work. But it was too little too late for Macon. See, that's again, pressure drives, pressure kills. Shorbagi's having to really hustle and struggle here. See, this is what Macon needed to do earlier on in the match. The loose ball and there it is and that's Shrobagi winning so one thing I did want to point out is that Macon before this match played all of his other matches on the traditional courts so there is definitely an adjustment factor that needs to take place when you go from traditional courts to the glass court because the ball is a little bit more difficult to see the atmosphere is different the bounce of the court is a little bit different it's a little bit more dead in the front of the court even in the back of the court the ball comes off the front wall a little bit faster sometimes depending on the ambient uh, atmosphere and the temperature in the arena so there are lots of factors and maybe Macon struggled a little bit to adjust to those as well but on the whole Shabagi was just way way too good today so here's something I want to talk about I mentioned this before but some of Shorbagi's assets that he really demonstrated in this match were one his natural deception the fact that he hit multiple shots from similar positions and similar setups on top of the natural deception just made it really hard for Macon and he had to make a lot of hard movements which then also probably not only took a toll on his body he's quite strong so you couldn't quite see it in the match in my opinion but more than anything, it impacted his mind to say, holy crap, like, I don't know where he's going to hit the ball. I don't know what's coming next. And that can, that feeling can make, leave you very unsettled when you're playing your opponent, because then you don't know what's coming and you don't know how to finish the point or win the point. And then the third thing, and I'm going to show you all of this in a moment, is that he would, Shrabagi is actually using different swings to hit the same shot. And that's another, that's, a, that's another form of deception. And that just shows you the degree of skill that a lot of these top players have. So some of the nuances that we're going to touch upon in a moment, and I'm going to show you through some slow motion clips, are that Shrabagi doesn't have a massive, massive setup and backswing. So he doesn't start all the way up here. He usually starts in this sort of a position here. He also adjusts his body and his racket prep depending on how much pressure he's under, the height of the ball, and actually the follow through adjusts based on that as well, as well as the shot that he chooses to execute. 
his racket face angle changes depending on the type of shot he's hitting and he adjusts his height so he'll bend his knees bend at the waist all of those things depending on how high or low the ball is and he hits multiple shots off of either leg now you know it's it's difficult to do all of these things unless you're a pretty advanced player but that's why Mohamed Sherbagi is one of the best if not the best in the world so let me let me break some of this down for you in slow motion here so the first thing we're going to look at is Shorbagi's. So the first thing I want to share with you guys is Shorbagi's natural deception. And you're going to see three clips on your screen. And the first thing I want to show you guys is that in regardless of what shot he's hitting, I'm not going to tell you what shots he's hitting, <laughs> his racket prep is very, very similar. His body angle is very similar. So his chest is turned a little bit more towards the back wall, side wall, back wall. His racket prep is in that position that I mentioned earlier. His eyes are on the ball. His left hand is out for balance and support. He's stepping in with his right leg each time in these situations. And then if we go through this, like I said, stepping in with the right leg, he's got that V position with his elbow so the elbow is pointed down and then like I said chest shoulders hips all of them are pointed towards the side wall and then from there notice he makes contact depending right there arm is extended when he's making contact each time so a lot of players hit like this and they're really cramped when they're hitting Shurbagi is nice and extended to give himself space he knows naturally how much space he needs to hit the ball and like I said depending on how much pressure he's under when he's under a little bit more pressure he bends at the knee bends at the waist a little bit more when he's under moderate pressure there's a little bit less of a bend when he's under minimal pressure he's a little bit more upright so he's making all of these minor adjustments. And again, this is all comes through a ton of practice and training. And here we go. He hits three different shots. The clip on the left, he hits a straight drive. Clip in the middle, he hits the volley drop. Clip on the right, he hits a cross court lob. And what you'll notice is that in each of these scenarios, his follow through is a little bit different. So in the clip on the left, he kind of follows through forward in the clip in the middle his racket is hidden because he comes across a little bit more and the clip on the right because the ball is going cross court he comes across even more so again lots of nuances and things that you guys can practice as well when you're actually trying natural deception so i'm going to play these clips for you again from the beginning in slow-mo so you can see it without the pauses So the next thing I want to discuss is how Shurbagi hits the same shot with slightly different technique. So this is kind of a, a reverse natural deception. So check this out. So to do this, we're going to look at two clips. And here we're seeing how Shurbagi hits the straight drive in slightly different ways. So I'll play it through once and then I'll go back and I'll highlight the piece that I want you guys to really take note of. So here he is hitting a straight drive in both cases. And the thing I want to show you, you'll notice his everything is very similar. So setup is similar. He's on the right foot in both cases. He makes contact with the arm extended, racket face open. So this image looks exactly the same. But check this part out. So over here, He's got the arm extended out here, sort of as though he might, this is actually some technique that could show a straight drop because you really cut through that ball and then extend it out. Over here, he kind of bends the elbow and brings the racket across his body. So this is also another form of deception by opening up the body a little bit more over here on the right and bending the elbow. On the left, he's bit more closed and facing the side wall but he's got that swing as though he might play that drop with the cut so it's interesting to see how he's actually using two different swings two different follow-throughs the 
preliminary part of the swing and the setup and the approach is very similar, but it's the follow through that then adds this extra layer of deception. So I thought that that was uh, very interesting and I wanted to share that with you. And you see Joel Macon, he, he reads the ball, but he has a hard movement before. So watch Joel Macon's movement. So he's in a split step and then from his split step, he lands and see in the clip on the left, he's puts his right foot down because he initially, I, f I believe, starting to go forward and see his weight's going forward. And then he has to put the left foot to decelerate himself, reset the right foot, and then push back. And he's under pressure. He's a strong guy, so he, he recovers well, but he's under pressure. And then he forces the loose ball. See right there? The ball's going to come loose. It's going off the side wall, and the Shrivagi can attack it again. So that subtle change in technique, showing the drop, keeping the body square, can really, really open up your uh, and increase your options. So now the other clip I want to show you guys is when it comes to a straight volley drop. So I'll play it for you once and then we'll review it in a moment. So let's check that out one more time. So over here in the clip on the left, Shorbagi has to move a little bit faster to the ball. In the clip on the right, he's very set already. And the big, see, look at this body position pretty similar racket position pretty similar elbow all of it is very very similar the big difference when he makes contact and you would have probably already noticed is on the clip on the right he's going with his right leg which is a closed stance hit clip on the left he's going with an open stance hit so his left leg is forward the other thing that you'll notice is that in the clip on the left, Shorbagi is making contact with the ball a lot lower. In the clip on the right, he's making contact with the ball higher. And if we were to break this down to show you the swing, you'll notice that his swing is a little bit different. In the clip on the left, he has to come through the ball a little bit more, and then he does go up a little bit. But in the clip on the right, he opens up more. Because the ball is higher, you have to come down and then cut it. And when you cut it, the racket follows through up a little bit more. And the clip on the left, because it's lower, you can't go down on it as much because the ball is going to go into the tin. So you have to kind of come across and cut it and then you follow because you want to slice and cut that ball a bit, you end up with a slightly upward follow through. So it's interesting to see that he's using different legs, hitting the same shot, and the swing is slightly different because of the height of the ball. So these are the subtleties, and this is why it's really important when you're doing solo practice to practice it, feeding yourself or hitting balls from different angles, with different pace, with different height, because you get to practice all of those things because the swing is never identical. This We have a rubric for the swing, and then it adapts depending on the situation, the pace, the pressure, and all these other factors. So that's the end of that. And I don't know, I found, I found this really, really powerful to see how good Muhammad Shrabagi really is. And yeah, Joel Macon didn't have the best day. Joel Macon did not get to practice or play previous matches on the glass court. But Muhammad Shrabagi's basic game was so accurate and his finishing was so accurate. And then when you add in these subtleties that we just discussed right now, it's no wonder that he's beating guys like Joel Macon 3-0. And truthfully, if he continues with this form, I can't see how anyone else is going to, to take him down in this tournament. Well, as always, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. Put a comment, I'd love to hear from you. Share your thoughts. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Please share it with any family or friends that are into squash. I appreciate your support, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.